Good morning and welcome to the EGS Anywhere panel of Pivot 2020. EGS, Deep EGS, Supercritical and Beyond. Scalable geothermal concepts can enable production of geothermal energy anywhere in the world. If we drill deep enough anywhere on Earth, we could find a resource for geothermal energy. The challenge comes in the form of how to recover these thermal resources in an effective, safe, and environmentally sustainable way. This panel is going to explore engineered or, e or enhanced geothermal systems, EGS, how these systems are created, the challenges associated with reservoir connectivity, integrity, seismicity, with risk and mitigation, and how the application of oil and gas technologies could be leveraged to address some of these EGS challenges. We're also going to discuss supercritical systems, those geologic systems that exist above the supercritical point of water. These have some very unique opportunities. We'll also share some of the challenges with EGS. I'm Rafa Gorney. I'll be your moderator for this session. I'm the geothermal program manager at the Idaho National Laboratory. I'm leading the. I'm also leading the reservoir modeling team for DOE's Forge program or the initiative, or the process for creating the United States' flagship for geothermal energy research. My research interests center on energy and water related issues, primarily focusing on uh, investigations of fluid flow, heat transport, mechanics, and fractured and fracture networks, and the development of massively parallel simulators to describe these systems. I've been focusing on EGS for nearly the last decade, and I'm very excited to see all the attention and progress geothermal has been making of late, and I'm very happy to be part of Pivot 2020. I've been a very vocal that geothermal needs to jump the technology development curve and take the learnings from oil and gas industry with shale gas and apply those to geothermal energy development. Many thanks to the Pivot 2020 organizers for making this important step to bring these two worlds together. And with that, I'm going to please let me allow my panelists for this session. Uh, my first panelist is Vic Rao, the Executive Director of the Research Triangle Energy Consortium and the former CEO of Halliburton. Susan Petty, the President and CTO of Althrock Energy and the CTO of Cirque Energy. John McLennan, a professor at the University of Utah's Chemical Engineering, and is also the with me, the co-PI, uh, the principal investigator of the Utah Forge EGS project. Isabel Shambefort, the senior geothermal scientist uh, with GNS Science in New Zealand. And lastly, uh, Makul Sharma, the professor and chair of the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm going to give each panelist two minutes or so to discuss why they think this is important, why they're part of this Pivot 2020, and tell us a little bit about themselves. So with no further ado, uh, Vic, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. So as you mentioned, as Robert mentioned, I retired as CTO of Halliburton a dozen years ago. Since then, I've been uh, advising folks, especially startups and writing books and things that retired people do. Let me get into what brought me to So I'm a new entrant into the geothermal arena. Uh, I used to be a skeptic. When I, at Halliburton, I pretty much thought it was very niche, uh, niche place. And I essentially discouraged my folks into looking much into it. Uh, uh, most lately, uh, I've seen the advances in it uh, and think now think it is scalable. Before that, my real problem was not, I didn't think it was scalable. And I now think we can get utility scale dispatchable electricity. In the full interest of disclosure, uh, I advise an EGS outfit called Fervo Energy and a closed loop outfit called Sage Geosciences. So uh, while I do not expect that to color my thinking in too many ways, my remarks in too many ways, uh, you need to know that. And I'm not going to take my two minutes, but somebody else doesn't have to take my one minute. <laughs> so uh, thanks, Vic, and thanks for that nice introduction. Um, Susan, I'll turn it over to you. Great. So I'm Susan Petty. I'm the CTO of CERC Energy, which is a geothermal uh, project operator and developer. We have five operating power geothermal power plants in the Western US. And I'm also the founder, uh, president, and chief technology officer for Alter Rock Energy. And I've been in the geothermal business for 42 years. A mm -hmm. lot of that time has been focused on stimulating, fracturing, creating geothermal reservoirs uh, through using methods that are and were typical in oil and gas and have been used in um, unconventional oil and gas plays. So I, I've started out with a 
the first well that was drilled on the Big Island while I was a graduate student at University of Hawaii. And I've worked all over the world on geothermal energy. Um, I also was involved with the Fenton Hill Project. I did uh, stimulations at um, the Baca Grande in New Mexico and East Mesa Field. All, uh, many, many of the early um, fracturing uh, efforts that were funded by the US government. I was also involved with the Eastern Shale Gas Project. You can now tell I'm pretty old. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, currently, Alterock has changed its focus, uh, not away from fracturing. We're still wanting to do that, but we are really moving towards uh, going to very, very high temperatures to increase the energy density of the resource that we're trying to tap and to uh, get to the point where we can have very, very high electric conversion efficiency, which we hope will bring down costs dramatically. So that's where we are, we're headed. Thanks, um, Sue. <laughs> we'll come back. Um, let me transition to John McLennan. So I, I would just in prefacing John, I, I'd say, you know, John and I both work on the Utah Forge project. We lead different aspects of, of the program and we disagree on almost everything. So we always have very colorful discussions. <laughs> and so hopefully that you'll see this continue today. John. Uh, well, Rob, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, <laughs> As, as Rob mentioned, uh, you know, my challenge on Forge is to drill two wells and interconnect those wells with hydraulic fractures. And my background in order to do this is that I started my career um, uh, working on a PhD that was related to Fenton Hill. I was lucky enough to actually um, participate in some of the fracturing on Fenton Hill. And then I took a 30 year uh, diversion to the oil and gas business and moved back to geothermal working on Raft River um, and recently on, on Forge. And what strikes me along the way is, is, is the, the room for collaboration, for, for joint development, and also uh, some of the philosophical differences that exist between the geothermal industry and the oil and gas industry. And so like Vic, I'll give up one minute of my time uh, for the, the common good. Thank you, John. Uh, I'd mentioned that, you know, much like a congressional hearing, you yield your time, I take the back and, and we'll distribute it later. Um, Isabel, uh, let me hand it over to you. Hi, um, so I'm Isabel Chamfort. I am a senior scientist at GNS Science. Um, I am leading the uh, newly founded program called Geothermal the Next Generation in New Zealand um, to explore um, possible supercritical resources here. Um, so this is a really exciting time. I am as well the project leader under um, our New Zealand um, New Zealand Geothermal Future, the project leader of high enthalpy research. And um, I have a little different background compared to the rest of you. I come for actually all deposit research. Um, and I moved 10 years ago uh, when I moved to New Zealand, um, I moved to geothermal and the reason was um, I wanted to have a better effect um, on the planet to be and having something that is a bit more linked with the needs of, of um, the community as a whole. So um, yeah, that's about me. My main interest is looking at what's happening when you're drilling closer to magmas and um, and what are the geology associated with that? So I have a very geological academic background, if you want to say. Um, another thing that is really close to our heart here is to actually communicate about um, geothermal and communicate about the science um, we are doing to enable, obviously, in the future, um, the development of non-conventional resources. And that's about Thank it. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, last but definitely not least, uh, Mukul. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Rob. Uh, so so uh, I'm Mukul Sharma. I'm, uh, I've been involved in uh, um, the oil and gas side of the business and also in the geothermal side a little bit uh, for the last 40 years. Um, uh, for the first, uh, back in the in the 80s, um, I was involved in some early work on, on geothermal and I left the geothermal business for about 30 years. 
uh, working primarily on uh, reservoir modeling and, and uh, reservoir engineering. Um, and then the last 20 years uh, on working on hydraulic fracturing, modeling as well as um, doing some experimental work. Uh, I lead a, a, a joint industry program here related to hydraulic fracturing, uh, which is funded by um, most of the oil and gas companies in the US and abroad. Um, we have been working primarily in looking at unconventionals in the last 15 years or so. And I will say that we've learned a lot in the last 15 years in how to fracture wells, how to do things um, uh, a certain way uh, in, in horizontal wells and, and fracturing and so forth. And so my interest in geothermal um, has arisen from my background in, in, in fracturing and horizontal drilling. And in fact, if somebody had asked me um, about 10 years ago what I thought of geothermal, I would have said, like a lot of people would, uh, that it was a niche uh, application, uh, a niche energy source that um, uh, was, was struggling to be commercial. Um, but I think um, given what we have learned over the last 15 years in, in how to complete these wells, I think there's a real opportunity in applying all our learnings from the oil and gas side towards um, towards uh, geothermal. Um, I will say that EGS systems uh, compared to closed loop actually can um, uh, can really um, dramatically lower costs in many ways. And we can talk about this some more, but uh, and there are lots of technical issues and social issues associated with uh, applying hydraulic fracturing in um, in geothermal systems um, and uh, high temperatures. How do you in, how do you get good connectivity between fractures? How do you get profile control in these wells and what kind of popping should be used and so forth? So I will uh, Thank hold off on that discussion as the questions come in, but I will stop there. Thank you, McCool. And, and you mentioned the good things as the questions come in. So um, just for some housekeeping, um, if you're interested in asking questions of the panelists, there is the, the Q&A or the question part where you can actually submit a question. We have moderators looking through those things and they'll feed them to the panel, feed them to me as we go. Um, I, we do have some prepared questions that we're going to start with, and then as we go through a few of those, we'll start um, uh, entertaining questions from the audience. So please have the questions coming. And, and I would always say we don't get them all answered on, on um, live today. Um, we can keep this discussion going in other means later. So I'm going to take the, you know, as I'm the moderator, uh, I will take the bully pulpit and, and, and take the liberty of asking the first few questions. And the first question I'm asked goes to John McLennan. Uh, John, as the lead for the well design, drilling, and completion for the Utah Forge program, what is the one biggest hurdle that you care current that you're that you're currently facing, and how are you approaching a solution? Uh, just one. <laughs> so your highest one. Yes. All right. The the, the immediate issue is is uh, dr drilling a high angle well in a material that uh, typically has uh, rates of penetration that are less than 10 feet per hour and applying directional technologies to uh, to to the, the geothermal industry. Um, there have been some cases where geothermal wells have been drilled at, at moderate, moderate angles, but I think we're all interested in applying, certainly in these medium temperature rocks, uh, um, PDC bits, directional control, measurements at the bit, and drilling these holes and and safely and effectively running and cementing casing in these wells. That's 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 my immediate challenge. That's all. Okay, <laughs> but cool. Well, can you can you, uh, can you do you have any comments on that? What are your thoughts? Well, I think I think uh, uh, you know John John said it well in in terms of where we start, which is uh, drilling these very hard rocks at high temperatures. I mean that certainly is a challenge. There's no question about that. But on the uh, on the fracturing side, I would say that getting good connectivity between well bores in a predictable way, and ensuring that if you were to use uh, long laterals, um, having a uniform distribution of fluid across the entire lateral, uh, I would ra rate those as the two biggest challenges um, on the on the fracturing side. Thanks, McCool. And actually, you know, I think Sue, you've had some very practical experience in, in doing some of these EGS stimulations. Um, I'm going to ask you to kind of weigh in here. 
but I'm, but I'm going to take the liberty of saying a few things myself. So, McCool, you mentioned something that I've been thinking quite a bit about, and that is getting equal distribution of fluid out of a long, long reach ladder with a multi stage stimulation. Mm-hmm. Um, I like, we're not talking about it now, but I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, some limited entry techniques that, we, that are pretty common oil and gas that could bring, you know, strong to bear um, for geothermal, especially in, in how we do some completions. But, Sue, so, will you weigh in for us here from your experience? You know, I, I know from very detailed where we've spoken in the past. Yeah, so on the uh, issue of directional drilling and geothermal, I mean, we directionally drill all our geothermal wells pretty much, and some of them have very, very high angle. Uh, in the geysers, particularly, we have long reach wells. They tend not to, we tend not to go 90 degrees just because we don't have to, and it's expensive to do it, but we have done that, and, and we do uh, sometimes do, you know, very, very high angle, 75%. Um, well, so so that's doable. Uh, PDC bits, yeah, that is a real serious uh, issue. PDC bits at high temperature are are not in, in these hard, brittle rocks are not that great, and definitely need some work there. Um, on the fracturing and connectivity, that's an issue in the past because we tried to drill two parallel well bores and fracture between them. And one of the issues we run into, particularly in geothermal, is that with depth, the um, stresses tend to change. And we see, you know, stress measurements we make up at a shallower depth may not, uh, you know, reflect the real uh, stress situation at depth. So we now drill, when we do EGS stimulations, we drill uh, one well, and then we fracture and map the fractures, and then we drill into them. And because we do have good directional control, even in these hot rocks, we can, uh, you know, direct our well board to intersect as many of those created fractures as possible. Thanks, Susan. Um, Vic, you know, you mentioned your opening comments, you know, the, you know, about scalability and, and some skepticism. So how scalable do you think ge- the geothermal could be, especially in the context of an EGS system? And what do you think, what, what's the key research that, that needs to be done to ensure that we could so get this deployable at industry or commercial scales to make it impactful? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I'll go with EGS since you asked for that. And uh, for EGS uh, to be successful, what we need, the industry needs, is uh, subsurface mapping uh, of temperature versus depth. And also uh, responsive to something Susan said, uh, wh- one of the things that makes it easier to get fractures propagate is if you intersect natural fractures. So, uh, e- so EGS is much better off when it can intersect natural fractures. So mapping of natural fractures worldwide, mapping of temperature versus depth, uh, will will be needed. Then, then for closed loop, basically what will be needed is uh, improvements in cost. And then finally, you know, on the mapping deal, this is this is an analog with geophysical, okay? And I wouldn't be surprised if people think this is going to take off, that companies step forward, do the mapping, and just like it happened in geophysics, uh, make libraries, do it in spec, do some custom shoots, make it available to each other. That's what's going to proliferate it. And I think we need those players as well, not just the people who drill. Thanks, Vic. You, you, you mentioned something about, you know, getting players to come into the game. And, and when um, we, we talked about some of the introductory remarks when, when Isabel mentioned you came from an ore deposits and that kind of thing. But, you know, I think of it a lot of times the economics of geothermal systems to be more akin with economics of, of you know, minerals. Um, cause, you know, in general, you see margins are tight and, and, and things are small, so which I think is, a you know, kind of a, a large departure from the normal economics we look at from the oil and gas industry. Um, so what do you think here? Because, you know, you're in your role in working for an energy company, a producing company right now. Uh, how does that economics work out for you guys? And, and what do you think the, the path might be from what, what Vic was saying? Well, search strategy has been to acquire pre-existing projects that are in distress and you know treat them as fixer uppers so we tend not to do a whole lot of exploration to find geothermal resources but we do use the technology that alterock has used in the past to stimulate wells so if we have a field that has 
uh, hot wells that are in tight rock. Um, we, we do use stimulation technology to improve them. Um, so what we see is that the economics of these projects is really dependent on the temperature and flow rate you can get out of each well. And particularly at the low flow rate, at the low temperatures that CERT projects operate at, we need really, really high flow rates to make this work economically. But yeah, we're we're going 24-7. We're looking at um, you know thermal energy storage to help improve our economics. Thank you. Um, let me transition a little bit. So we've been talking, you know, you just, you know, temperatures came up a few times and we've been focusing, you know, on EGS technologies and, and we're going to come back to it. But um, Isabel, you know, with all this, you know, there has been some considerable attention in supercritical systems. Um, what do you think the role there that they could bring in, into bringing more geothermal forward to the forefront? What do you see? Are there different challenges that we're facing or what are similar challenges that compared to EGS um, and, and, and vice versa? Um, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, there's a lot of supercritical projects. I mean, a lot. Where, where the, the, the challenge, the first challenge is that it's probably not everywhere that you can develop supercritical um, science and supercritical reservoir. Um, one of the biggest challenges as well is to combine, um, if we found supercritical fluid, um, is to have a well that is, you know, viable, basically. Um, and that you can maintain some of the wells that we have. Um, the first one, for example, IDDP1, um, was lost very quickly and for several reasons. Is that when you're going very close to magma, you have a lot of um, corrosive fluid. So it's a lot of engineering developments that is happening um, right now in terms of um, casing stability. Um, one of the things as well that is needs to improve is the design actually of how you're utilizing such a powerful fluid um, once you're getting it at the surface. Um, so again, this this is there's a worldwide investment in into that space. Um, in terms of drilling, um, which is not necessarily where where I'm really clued in, um, but Obviously, because you're going towards high temperature, everything is a little bit more challenging. We don't have all the downhole uh, tools that you will have in EGS or conventional geothermal. We can't apply um, the same thing, I would say, for the, the drill the drill bits. So everything needs to be upscaled for temperature that can resist almost 400 degrees. So there's a lot of challenges. The Icelandic have been doing really well um, in doing this. Japanese as well are going. There's really a worldwide push because if we manage to get that, the, the, the return in energy, if you want, that we can have is going to be um, terrific. So, so yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, as a people around, if you have some something to add on, Susan, maybe on, on actually the drilling technology, that would be great. That, you, know, you mentioned uh, there's a lot of things you mentioned there. Thank you for that. You know, I, I find it, uh, uh, you know, you, the one thing you said near the end was energy, you know, the energy density that we can get from super criticals. And, that, that, and I think that is a key thing that could bring people in. I know, Sue, you had a comment. And also, I want to I want to transition and, and ask and, and push a follow up to Vic as well. But Sue, um, uh, please weigh in. Yeah, so um, one of the things that we've focused on is getting to super critical temperature rock and then fracturing it and introducing, uh, you know, fluid to that in an EGS system at supercritical temperatures because the supercritical, indeed, as Isabel says, the supercritical natural systems, the fluids are very, very challenging. I mean, I've worked on supercritical systems in Indonesia, in the U.S., and um, it's, it's really a challenge to produce those fluids. But we're hopeful that if we can uh, do an EGS project where we're introducing fluid from the surface that we can get around some of that where we don't have the magmatic gases. And on the drilling side, um, you know, when we get up to these very high temperatures, one of the things we've found is that our rate of penetration tends to go up. I think we're doing a lot of thermal fracturing uh, when we drill these wells. Very, thank you very much. Um, but you know, you, you know, mentioned that you know the the, the potential the corrosivity of the fluid and, and and some of those challenges. Vic, that kind of comes back into some of the things we were saying earlier. You know, even for a you know a closed loop design, 
you know, it, um, what do you see there? How we can apply, you know, essentially, you know, 400 degree C thing in the bottom of a bottom hole well temperatures are higher. Um, what, what are there particular challenges there? I, I'm, I'm thinking to like materials challenges um, in addition to, you know, accessing the reservoir, but actually having some standard technology we can actually use to have a sustainable production. Yeah, so let me use a time honored technique of answering the question I want to hear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think that uh, EGS at 200 C is going to be very effective if you know what you're doing here. Because water is a wonderful transmitter, uh, is, is a wonderful conductor. Uh, closed loops in general have the issue that you don't get thermal conductivity. So you got to go to supercritical uh, in order to make closed loops. Well, I shouldn't be that categorical. But I think you have to go to supercritical. In our supercritical means the water in the supercritical state, which is a heck of a lot of suffering temperature. So, and you deal with materials of all sorts. So I would I would say that EGS at 200 C is something that will proliferate uh, long before supercritical uh, closed loop becomes uh, uh, economically viable. And I think as far as the drilling goes. Uh, I'm not afraid to drill horizontal wells at 200 C. Uh, uh, it depends on the rock. Not all rock is basalt. There, you know, some there's a lot of sedimentary rock at 200 C. So I, we'll get there. So if, and if the, if the oil industry steps up all, and says, "Let's solve this problem," then some of these issues go away. And finally, to the point that uh, John made earlier, measurement while drilling is difficult. Well, geez, you know, uh, we 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 are strapping fiber optic cable to the casing. Okay. And so we can do a lot of measurement, uh, which is different from normal MWD. So these things can be solved. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank the audience. We're getting a great a plethora of questions coming in. I have some additional prepared questions. I'm just going to I'm going to I'm going to pose, pose one more, and then I'm going to dive into some of the audience supplied questions. Um, so McCool, I want to take a step back and, and you know think about things in a more general sense. Um, why geothermal? Why now? And from an oil and gas perspective, what do you think the biggest impact on, on a geothermal slash oil and gas partnership can have in, in the immediate future, in the next year, the next two years? Um, can you share your thoughts on that for us? Yeah, I think um, what what really I think um, changed my opinion was that, uh, you know, we've traditionally done geothermal with um, deviated or vertical wells with single fractures or maybe two fractures and, and you know it's a relatively small number of fractures whereas uh, what is possible today with uh, with you know putting in uh, you know 100 or 200 fractures in, into a single well you could get contact areas between the rock and the fluid that were an order of magnitude larger than what we were able to achieve before uh, at least an order of magnitude larger and and that really does transform the way the energy recovery rate that you can achieve in these in these wells. Uh, so to me, uh, that could be uh, the game changer uh, in the future. Now we still have to work on a lot of technical issues before we can actually claim that we achieve that. But I think in my mind, um, the ability to create large surface areas that we could circulate fluids through uh, is the central um, uh, point that really drives me to believe that you can actually achieve much larger efficiencies, much larger heat recovery rates than you could in the past. And uh, and I think we know how to do that primarily from learnings from the oil and gas sector that we've learned over the last 15 years. And we didn't know how to do that very well, you know, 10 years ago even. So so I think we've learned a lot in the last 10, 15 years. So John, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of pivot back to you. Um, McCool mentioned you know technical issues. And you know, if, if anything, if anyone's going to find a technical issue, you know, it, it's going to be us working at the Utah Forge program. You know, w you know, we're actually at the forefront trying to uh, do some of these things right now. So, can you weigh in here, uh, just, sure. just you know, briefly? Sure. You know, one one of the common themes is 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 creation of surface area, but in order to be able to create the surface area, it, it also requires um, a, an effective isolation technology and an effective cement job. I think that this is sometimes we sometimes forget this and we can learn a lot from the supercritical business just in terms of um, metallurgy counts, even in the lower temperature stuff, metallurgy counts and an effective cement job prior to hydraulic fracturing. 
may be one of the most critical elements. And we're really learning this from the oil industry of late who have found um, you know, substantial difficulties in terms of uh, casing collapse and uh, degradation of pipe associated with uh, extensive fracturing. So I say you need the surface area, but you need the underpin underpinnings um, to be able to do those fractures effectively. And and that and in terms of that, that may have have us um, relooking at some of our cementing in terms of the effectiveness of foam cement that we've done in the past that may may really not be living up to spec, and we really need to evaluate cementing um, um, significantly. Thanks, John. And and I would mention as you were speaking, I'm, I'm watching all the other panelists, and I and you got a lot of reactions there. So. Um, first, let me transition to, to, to Susan, um, and, and I know because I saw her kind of moving her chair when you said something. Uh, Vic, I'm going to come. I'm going to come to you next. So, uh. okay. So there's a reason that we do not do cement and perforate completions in geothermal, and there's a and there's also a reason why our well bores are so much larger than the well bores typically drilled in oil and gas. In oil and gas, one of the most common bit sizes used is a six and three quarter inch bit. And in geothermal, our most common bit is a 12 and a half. So we drill big wells and we do not cement and perforate in our completions because we need to flow really, really high flow rates to make these low temperature, lower enthalpy fluids. And I'm talking about temperatures up to 225C. So in order to make that economic to produce, we need to produce really high flow rates. And you kind of can't do that through a cement and perforate completion and a small well bore diameter because you have too much pressure drop and you have to pay for pressure. That's something you just have to do. So we have gone to large diameters. We've gone to um, completing either open hole or with perforated liners. Now in oil and gas, you can do multiple stimulations using you know sliding sleeve devices in the open hole and um, that is something that I really think we're going to need to get to. On the other hand, um, John is absolutely right. A good cement job is absolutely crucial to the long-term stability and viability of your well, particularly at very high temperature. Being able to withstand the thermal stresses that come from thermal cycling and particularly if we're talking you know, supercritical temperatures, that is very, very tough. So we need to look at our materials, we look at our well designs to be able to design these wells to last if we're going to go to high temperature. Vic, what are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. So I, I was going to say that I'm not afraid to drill and complete a 200 degree C horizontal well. I'm not afraid to put multi-stage fractures. I'm not afraid to make sure that you get the flows through the through the clusters you want to. Uh, uh, these are, if they're not straightforward, uh, they can be straightforward if the industry steps up and says, we will make this work, okay? Uh, and see, for example, uh, one of the embodiments is when you, to, to connect between the injector well and the producer well, uh, you have to have the factors connect. You can take advantage of what the industry has learned, which is frack hits. Frack hits are bad in shale. They are good in geothermal. So it, it, the industry has learned stuff that makes me not at all concerned with multi-stage fracturing in 200 degrees C. Very good, very good. Um, thank you. Oh, uh, McCool, did, I saw you raise your hand or? or... Well, I was uh, I was just going to add, uh, I was just going to agree with, with Vic. Uh, I, I think that, um, there's, um, you know, uh, when we frack wells, we we uh, we inject at 90 barrels a minute. OK, that's over 100,000 barrels a day. And so you can certainly go at very high rates and uh, you can and you can certainly uh, frack at, at 200 degrees C. We can we know how to do that. We have done it before. There is a challenge. I mean, I'm not saying that these aren't challenging things, but I think as Vic said, if you put your mind to it, these are doable things. And I think it really the, the dividend that you get, the, the benefits that you get from doing that are enormous. And so I think we should set our sights on being able to make that possible in geothermal wells. And I think the Ford site, for example, like that you've been involved in, Rob and, and, and John, I think is a great example of trying to do these things and seeing how we can make them work and, and make them work better than we have in the in the oil and gas side at high temperatures. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to let you let you weigh in, and then I'm going to actually transition into you know we're about on time, but we have so many great questions coming, better than the questions I kind of came up with for to start this panel. So, Susan, um, yeah, go ahead, and then we'll transition as, as soon as you finish. So the wells that we produce in our natural geothermal systems typically produce a hundred thousand barrels a day or more, and but they have to do it with a fairly low pressure drop. So when you're fracturing it. Um, those high rates, you are putting a lot of pressure on that because there's a lot of pressure drop involved. And so we have to flow these high flow rates with low pressure as long as we are at these around 200 degrees C kind of temperatures. But if we go up to temperatures greater than 450 C, at these high temperatures, the energy density is so much better and the conversion efficiency is so much better it, we can get 10 times as much out mm -hmm. of the same flow rate. So we're looking at being able to get go from producing five to seven megawatts out of a well to be able to produce 40 to 50 megawatts a well for the same flow rate. That's why we want to go to these very high temperatures. And, and Isabel, I see you nodding and agreeing with us <laughs> very, very animately. So I'll, I'm going to let you have the last word on this question and then I'll transition. Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, you have so much. Um, it's almost, I mean, I'm not going to say it's going to be easier, but as, as Susan said, the energy that you can get from higher temperature, and when I say higher, I mean above 300, you know, 50 degree, like those high temperature, um, because your thermal stimulation is going to be more efficient. Your, your, as, as Susan said, you're going to thermally during the drilling, you're actually creating some fracture that will be useful. Um, so it's almost like why restricting ourselves to, you know, 200 degree at that point. If you have the resources to go higher in temperature, um, I will be with Susan on that and say drill, drill hotter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. OK, I'm going to transition now to some of the audience supplied questions. Um, keep them coming, please. I don't, by the, by the many of the, the great questions that have already been filtered and, and forwarded on to me, I already know we won't get to all of your questions, but keep them coming. This is something that us as a group, and maybe we can even come back later and have another discussion. Um, but the first one I'm going to bring up is from Matt, and I'm going to do these in the order that I got them. So if, if you're po popping questions there now, I really can't scroll through and see what the most recent ones are, but I'm going to try to keep up uh, as much as I can. So the first question I'm going to pose and it's, it's timely. It's from Matt. It says, uh, what is the biggest difference in hydraulic fracturing for EGS um, versus oil and gas? Do the skills and knowledge transfer directly? And I'm going to push this question first to John, and then I'm going to ask a few other panelists to weigh in. Well, let me, let me, let me tell you about the, one of the fractures that was done in Fenton Hill in December of 1983. And that was a treatment that was done at 50 barrels a minute, uh, high rate, like what we do today, or moderate rate. It was high rate then. Uh, that treatment lasted for 60 hours, um, and it pumped slick water. Sound familiar? And it pumped fine-grained calcium carbonate as a fluid loss agent and as a propent. So, uh, you know, things haven't changed a great deal. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, you're laughing. I think you almost you rolled backwards in your chair when he said some of that. So, um, what are your thoughts here? Oh no, I, I think I think that um, uh, uh, you know I, I agree I agree with John that there's there's a lot of commonality between uh, what we do in, in in oil and gas and and what we do in uh, uh, what we would like to do in, in geothermal. Um, uh, I think that uh, the points that were brought up in terms of high rates and 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 so forth are are good points, and I think we need to figure out how we can achieve those things. Larger well bores may well be required, and as uh, as uh, uh, Susan was, was mentioning. Um, but I, the key uh, differences between oil and gas applications versus geothermal applications are, in oil and gas, you don't want to connect the well bores. You want to drain independent areas of the reservoir. In geothermal, you want to connect these, and you want to connect them fairly well across the entire lateral which is exactly the opposite of what you're trying to do in, in, uh, in, in oil and gas, right? You want to have pretty good uh, uh, profile control, and that's similar to what you want to do in oil and gas. You want to be able to, if you, if you have 10 clusters in a stage, you want all 10 clusters to propagate fractures and not have a thief fracture 
that propagates. And that's similar to what you want to achieve in oil and gas. Right. And you mentioned, Rob, you know, limited entry, but there's other clever techniques that you have that, that you can do to try to uh, uh, prevent that from happening. And there's techniques you can do to make the profile much more uniform. So there's lots of similarities and a few differences. Thank you. Uh, McCool, or I'm sorry, Vic, you, 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 uh, you, you, you rate you to chime in. But responsive to the question, uh, hydraulic fracturing trained engineer walks right into the enterprise and goes to work the first day. Okay. The, the training is exactly the same. The only difference is in the back room where they do the modeling to say, okay, I want to create a fracture. I want to do things different, but that is what the modeling does. Then it informs the operation. The actual execution of the operation is identical. So as far as the hydraulic fracturing, if you will, if there's such an animal engineer goes. So, so these people who are currently out of work, walk straight in and go to work. Very good, very good. Um, I will come to another question here. I'm not sure it's unattributed, but um, and the question is, what are the most urgent technical challenges to solve that oil and gas professionals could transition and collaborate? How can they help? Um, I, I think I'm, I mean, I come right back to you. I think you're already starting to weigh into that, but uh, can you want to elaborate further in that context? Is this for me? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, so go back a little bit to say, to Isabel's point, now why don't we just go to 350C? If you want to get the oil and gas industry, industry as a whole, operators and service companies really into the game, you've got to get them going in volume on something. And that volume has to come from 200 degree stuff. Your 350 degree stuff is some ways away. So I'm saying baby steps, is, well, it's not even baby, these are pretty big steps too. <laughs> 200 degrees C, get going, get volume, get the industry comfortable with the notion, keep doing research because the closed loop and supercritical is going to need research in materials, reads and bits, it's going to need research. And so I'm just saying it's a stage thing, it's not either or, it's a question of staging. Very good, thank you. Um, I want to transition to another question. Or, Sue, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, if we keep, to, if people keep talking about 200 degrees C, our most recent fracturing effort at Newberry was uh, from 300 to 325C. So, and in fact, um, we have a second well that we're looking at that has a bottom line temperature of 348C, both directionally drilled. And these, I think, are where we need to be going. If we concentrate on 200 degrees C, our energy density is, is really so much less that it's going to take a lot of fluid flow, and that's a tough challenge. I, I don't agree at all. Uh, if you do multi-stage fracturing in 200 C, you have natural fractures that propagate. Uh, I, I, you can get material utility scale electricity produced at 200 degrees C if you do it right. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do 350. Okay, I'm just telling you that if you do, it is quite feasible. And the point is, it goes back to what I was saying earlier, we need to map the subsurface say, I personally think there's got a lot more opportunity for something with 200 degrees C and natural fractures than with 350. But it's not an either or for me. It is simply a question stating, if you think you can do 350 in high volume today, go for it. So your key point, Vic, is, is high volume. That's not high volume of fluid flow, it's high volume of mass of people. Um, getting engaged and getting into the, into the into the industry. The oil and gas people are not going to be interested unless it's scalable. They believe in scale. Okay, uh, if you want the geothermal to be an effective portion of an oil and gas company's portfolio, okay, just like oil is or gas is, it's got to be at scale. They're not going to look at one or two wells here and there. That's not going to work. That's why I was I was cool on this until recently. Until now, I think it is scalable. Very good. Thank you, sir. Um, another question, and, and this is, uh, uh, it comes, it's a question about India's central basins. It says there's great heat flow with very tight rocks. Are these conditions suitable for EGS? I, I, I want to answer myself and say, just say yes. Uh, yes. And, and, uh, <laughs> and we'll move on there to save the power. Um, and that's the beauty of, of all these technologies is, and that's what I like about geothermal. And, and I, you know, in full disclosure, I, you know, I, I led INL's fossil energy research for, for, for a number of years, 
and I'm, I'm very familiar with you know some of the, the you know the work for the fracking and reservoir development oil and gas. But what I liked about geothermal is you know I like I like seeing the drill bit turn, and the deeper you drill, you're gonna the rocks get hotter. They may at different rates, but they get hotter. So you can find a resource anywhere. Uh, it, it's just a matter of how hard you have to work to get to it. So um, I'll move on to another question here. Uh, this comes from Matt again. Um, can you explain the advantage of horizontal wells as opposed to angled wells for EGS? Um, I'm I, I don't well. Okay, I'm not sure who to point that to. I'm going to start with John because um, I, I know you've been struggling with this in your current well designed forge. We're not struggling, but considering. And uh, then we'll and we'll open it up to the first of the panel. So, in in a in a sense, um, high angle wells um, offer equivalency. They offer some advantages in terms of uh, uh, ability to fish tools, ability to run logs, um, uh, and in an oil and gas setting, a horizontal well may have. Uh, more advocacy because you might be trying to steer that well into a narrower zone. Whereas if you're talking about a geothermal zone and it's say it's a batholith or something like that that's moderately extensive, then you can get away with a well that has high angle but is not necessarily horizontal and uh, drills drills faster and more easily. Um, so so maybe that is the differentiation is is in terms of the thickness of the re, uh, of of the uh, therm of the reservoir. Okay. From my perspective, I see a lot. Of, I, I see the panel nodding in ascension. So I'm going to move on to the next question, uh, and actually, it was directed to to Professor Sharma um, about reservoir stimulation. Is there software that can estimate thermal energy similar to Eclipse for the oil and gas industry? I have my own answer to that, but I'm, I'm, I might weigh in um, after, after you address it. <laughs> uh, yes, there is, and so so you can actually build very general um, uh, 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 models that allow you to frack these wells uh, in, three, in three dimensions after you've characterized the site, of course, uh, uh, and then be able to do thermal calculations in terms of injecting fluids and, and calculating what kind of heat transfer you're going to get through the fractures, multiple fractures in a horizontal or deviated well and so forth. So the answer is absolutely yes. And you, and you can do this in a, with, with a, a, a geomechanical fluid flow compositional simulator that we have built here at the university in my group, and, and there are others as well. And I think, Rob, you've been involved in some of that. Thank you. And, and, now, and now comes for the shameless plug. I, I wonder if I get a chance to do this, but uh, um, we, um, there is a lot of work being done in this area, um, especially along in regards to the, 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 the forge initiative and the forge program. Uh, we have a monthly or bi-monthly forge modeling um, seminar um, a forum. And actually, there is one this week. It competes with, with Pivot, but I would encourage people to take a look at um, the, the forge website, Utah Forge uh, from the University of Utah. And uh, we actually discussed these kind of issues in detail on a monthly and a recurring basis and uh, it's open to the whole community so much like this we, we take questions and go back and forth so um I'll, i'm going to move on from there thank you for your answer um, mm -hmm. um next question is actually also directed to someone that says vic you mentioned scalable and dispatchable what do you mean by dispatchable in an egx context and i'm and sue i'm going to actually put you on the hook to answer this one as well what i mean by dispatchable is that you can produce electricity uh, at, at a high rate that is sufficient to feed the grid that you're serving. But a more interesting aspect of EGS and dispatchability, uh, unlike, for example, nuclear, is that it, it's, it can also be load following. So in properly designed EGS systems, you can load follow. Load following means when the load drops, you can actually turn down the output of your well. Uh, now, you, your generator is a little bit you know, it's getting a little less and more idle or whatever, but load following is a huge issue. So I think you can create enough load to free the grid. You can do it constantly and you can load follow. This is the, this is the key aspect of dispatchability that I'm talking about. Thank you. Susan, you want to weigh in? Yeah, so um, load following is indeed something you can do with with geothermal. But when we talk about dispatchability, the problem is we can't turn it on and off. The wells don't like it. The generation equipment doesn't like it. But what we've been looking at lately is thermal energy storage to go with your uh, generation that would allow you to um, add extra heat at the time when there's high demand and then just run the plant at base, you know, what's coming out of the ground the rest of the, the time. 
Um, and we think that rock is a great heat battery. So, uh, well, I don't think we're there yet for storing heat in the subsurface just because we don't have enough control over what's happening down there. I think we need to be working on that. And for now, we're looking at, you know, uh, thermal energy storage systems that use the box of rocks on the surface concept so we can learn how to use that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next question. And actually, I, I am uh, since the questions are coming in so well, um, just so the audience members know, I am I am cherry picking some of these. I uh, will come back to some of the ones I'm skipping if there is time. Um, so the next question I want to uh, point towards Isabel. Um, it's it, and it says the temperature or mapping temperature is not as simple as mapping gravity and magnetics. There is no surface instrument to map surface temp or subsurface temperature. What does this panel have to say about it? I want you to lead that off for us. And coming from the, I'm sure you do a lot of work in, in the TVZ, so I'm sure you have some very things to tell us. Yeah, this is a really good question actually, because it's very true. Without drilling, you can't map temperature basically. And so you, um, we have some tool we're using, we're trying to use, for example, um, the geophysical survey and try to better understand, well, you know your, your heart, better understand the distribution of, uh, of your temperature. The other tool that you may have as well is understanding in our, in our system where we have, um, where well, obviously we have magma depths, so we're understanding how the heat transfer from this magma to the surface to have an idea of how you can. So there's a lot of modeling involved into this um, to try, but you, you're right, we can't, without drilling, we can't for sure know the temperature. It's not an easy tool. Um, so the other way we, we're doing this is as well combining um, as much as we can all the geophysics with a stratigraphy that we can understand. And as such, we can understand as well what, what, what are the mineral reactions, which are really important um, to understand what kind of um, temperature dependence we may we may have as well in the rock. Um, if I mean, it, it is a, a challenge, um, and but we it's 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 a balance between knowing exactly where you need to drill and reaching it for the good temperature. In our example for the top of volcanic zone, obviously we don't have that much. We know if we drill, it's going to be hot more or less. Um, so it's 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 a matter. It's more a matter of permeability than a matter of temperature for us, mm -hmm. uh, which is a bit different. But obviously, if you're drilling closer for like to magma or specific thing for where we're trying to target, um, we need to better understand what are. The, the temperature hollow around certain area and why this is hotter than other. Um, and it's it's a lot of modeling um, that modeling that needs to be done. And you know, um, if there is someone else I want to pitch in um, on mapping temperature. Um, yeah, well, there's there's a few of us here, and, and, and you know, one of the key and this question, you know, um, I think came, comes about and really highlights one of the key challenges that geothermal face. In comparison to other like some of the intermittent renewables like wind or solar um, it's a lot easier to, to understand your resource if you just look at it you know you can see if the wind blows or the sun shines we have to do a little bit of work to understand what our thermal resource is sue will you weigh in yeah so one of the i think promising techniques that we're using to try and understand where the heat is in the subsurface is passive seismic monitoring and then again as isabel says you have to do a lot of modeling to go with that but we can use teleseismics and ambient noise tomography to begin to map high temperature zones in the subsurface. And we're hoping that this will also help us see where there are fractures that already exist. Um, but this is, this is you know, something that's developing now. Thank you. Um, next question. And this isn't just anyone in general, so I'm gonna throw it out there and I'm gonna watch for reactions by the panelists. Um, will propens be needed to develop EGS fracture networks so they'll stay open? What type of propens will work? Nobody even got a look in their face there. So, John, I'm going to call. Oh, oh, that's what did. Uh, Vic, weigh in for it. I, I think this is in, 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 propens are needed, in my opinion. But I think uh, the newer understanding of propens, and uh, John referred to it a little bit, uh, is that very small sizes. Uh, can be all floated in there. We, 
we probably don't need to use a lot of gel uh, in, in your in your in your hydraulic uh, fracturing fluid. It, what people will be concerned with is will the propens hold up at the high temperatures? Okay, and I think that uh, while they're slightly challenging, I don't think it's a huge issue. So yeah, I think yes, they need it, but I think we know how to handle it. I think Mukul is far more competent to answer this than me. Well, there, so there's you get the, the shine light, the spotlight shine onto you, Mukul. You you want to weigh in for us? So it's it's you know, it's a great question. It really is a good question, and I think that um, the the answer, the short answer is yes. You do need propens. I think um, it certainly makes uh, the flow a lot easier. Um, so depending on the temperature, you, know, you can go with sand or with with some other you know uh, ceramic type material at at the lower temperatures. But certainly, if you go to higher temperatures. Uh, you would need something better. And we had actually worked on that uh, some years ago, about 10, 15 years ago, and we've developed actually an alternative to sand, which is about uh, twice as expensive as sand, which is not saying much because sand is literally dirt cheap, but, but you, can actually get, uh, you can actually get something that is uh, uh, petroleum coke is, is, is the product, and you can actually buy this in railroad quantities, uh, you know, very, very large quantities. Uh, and it is, since it's been calcined, at 1200 degrees, it actually is very thermally stable. And, and we've actually measured the properties of this propen in the lab and found that it's quite thermally stable. It's, it's stable under mechanical stress. Uh, its conductivity is lower than sand at very high stresses, but you can actually use something like this if you go to very, very high temperatures, like 400 C, for example. Thank you. Um, so Isabel, you're being our geochemist here. Or I, or I, I'm going to call you a geochemist. Uh, yeah, yeah, kind I know of. That's the correct term. Kind of, but that's that, okay. you know, knowing you know if sand is going to to melt or or if we're going to dissolve or, or uh, uh, t talk to us about this. Yeah, sand, sand is definitely not an option because you're gonna you're gonna saturate very quickly at high temperature. Um, and one of the thing that that is challenging in geothermal compared probably to oil and gas is understanding the water rock interaction above above 200. When you're at low temperature, things take some time. When you're reaching 300, 350, <laughs> chemical reaction between your fluid and the rock are really, really fast. Mm -hmm. um, and we're talking weeks, we're not talking years here. It's not, it's not a geological time scale. Um, <laughs> so you can really seal, you're opening a fracture, but you can seal it very quickly. So I think there's, it will be really interesting and promising to, if there is some propen to actually test as well, simulate it in lab, um, mm -hmm. what are the effects in the rock, how fast we're gonna you know, coagulate, you're gonna create vein basically. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's just for, for the understanding of how fast we can seal a fracture right now. Uh, we also just quickly, because it's a matter of, you don't you we know that's happening it's happening conventional when you're injecting we do we do know that it's a matter of being far away so you don't block your well and i think the propen we still need a lot of research around that in high temperature to see what what other chemical can you know play on that because i don't think we have we have a very good um answer for now <laughs> thank you so much um, I'm going to transition, um, and actually, it's, it's a question directly to you, Bakul. Do you think the public will accept fracking crews doing a multi-stage fracking job? How can fracking become accepted to help transition to green energy geothermal? <coughs> yeah, that's a loaded question. I, I say I see <laughs> your how much, how much time do we have here? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a it's a it's a great question, and of course, as I as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, some of the issues that are that that go around fracturing is uh, is the social issues of, of you know social acceptability of hydraulic fracturing, which is a really important uh, question. Uh, um, I will say the, the way I usually answer that in, in short is to say that no matter what we do uh, in terms of producing energy, you have to do a cost benefit analysis. And uh, looking at the cost benefit analysis of hydraulic fracturing or the use of fracturing in geothermal, I think uh, we can make a case and we need to make a case to the public that this is uh, something that would benefit us greatly. Um, uh, there are risks, of course. Um, there is nothing that we do that doesn't have any risks. Um, but I think on, on, on balance, looking at a cost benefit analysis, it's very clear that hydraulic fracturing and fracturing applied to geothermal has tremendous benefits. And I think that's, that's really the way to put it to, to the public. 
Thank you so much. Vic, you have a comment? Yeah, yeah. quick comment. Uh, hydraulic fracturing in oil and gas has a couple of issues that the public objects to. One is the possibility of hydrocarbons coming up through the return fluid and doing bad things. Well, there are no hydrocarbons to come up in this case, if that's point one. The second thing is uh, they don't like the fact that uh, uh, breakers and, uh, and all kinds of chemicals are used in hydraulic fracturing normally. It may be possible in this case, if you use small enough uh, prop, prop and particularly if you use something like fly ash, which by the way, will survive high temperatures, uh, and which has been done recently, uh, then you could probably float this sucker in on almost on, on water. And th so you don't have a lot of gel. You don't have the kinds of chemicals that people are worried about. And then finally, if you do take advantage of natural fractures, then the energy to open a natural fracture is much less than the one to create and open a, a new fracture. And so the induced seismicity, which you kind of mentioned, one of you mentioned very briefly in the beginning, that concern will will be heavily mitigated. I mean, nothing goes away. And as Mukul said, there is no, no enterprise without risk. But I expect the likelihood of induced seismicity to be far less if we do this, well, EGS type if with natural fractures involved. So, so it, it is hydraulic fracturing, but it's not quite the same. <laughs> you know, that, that you, you mentioned a few things here and it kind of leads into a few other questions that came in. And, and the question I'm looking at now is, how can seismicity be managed? particularly with high flow rates. This is a severe concern in Europe. I have my own opinion. I think I will weigh in on it, but I'm going to actually put it out to the panelists first. So, um, John, let, let, can you weigh in for us on that one? Well, you know, the first key to this is, is uh, goes down to understanding the geologic regime that, that you, you carry out the, the stimulation in. Um, you know, ideally, uh, if you're in an extensional environment, and as Vic said, if there's natural fractures, then, then you have some things in your favor. If you're treating in a strike slip or a reverse faulting regime, um, then, then you have to be, be more careful. And you have to have the contingency programs dialed in up front and the stakeholder enfranchisement um, to, to proceed ahead with, with all of this. And then, and, and, and then you, can, you can manage it. Thanks, John. Um, so for my thoughts here, you know, I see you know, a lot of the concern comes up from induced seismicity when you think of the, the fracking term from oil and gas industry, or it could even be from, you know, large scale disposal of fluids, where in, in geothermal, especially you have a multi-well system or a, I won't say a closed loop of one form or another, if it's two wells with a fractured network between, is that we should be actually depressurizing one side and, and increasing the pressure in another. So that could help some mitigation for how far out our, our, our uh, how far we, we interpret or how far out away from the, those wells are we perturbate the the stress fields? Um, from, from so, um, Dick, please. Yeah. So I want to build on your point. Uh, in hydraulic fracturing uh, enterprises, uh, the seismicity, induced seismicity, has been from disposal of uh, waste <clears throat> fluids. Uh, this will not be the case here because they will not waste fluid disposal. That so that 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 point uh, I forgot to make, but but thank you thank you for making it. Uh, so I. I I think that in uh, that in principle, uh, he, he, oh, here it goes. Uh, you got to have an active fault. If an active fault is one that when you put energy into it, actually slips. All right, that active fault has to be of a certain length, because the amplitude of a seismic event, I'll call it an earthquake, is directly proportional to the length of the active fault. So, and as John pointed out, you you can you can detect these things. Okay, and 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 so maybe. And I'm going to use the R word. Maybe it's going to be regulated, but I won't use the word, so I just took it back. Okay. <laughs> but but I think but good operators should take a look at it and make sure that there are no active faults of reasonable length close by. Okay. So I think there are measures that can be taken. Uh, they don't have to be as much as necessary when opening up natural practice. But be that as it may, uh, we must put our keep our eye on that ball because that is one of the things that uh, that uh, the public. Is concerned about. Thank you so much. Um, Sue, are you want to weigh in? Yeah, so induced seismicity is, in, you do indeed need a, a big fault. Can't get a big seismic event without a big fault, but they don't need to be active, unfortunately. So the Rocky Mountain, I worked on the Rocky Mountain our arsenal, induced seismicity from uh, wastewater injection, and that 
was not an active fault. It was not a fault that had seen any seismicity in you know any time uh, that had been recorded. Whereas you do need to have that that big fault length. You can't get a big seismic event without it. So we have to have methods that map all the faults and fractures in the area as best we can to estimate our risk of induced seismicity. And doing that uh, seismic risk hazard analysis is really important ahead of any kind of you know long term injection without production. An active fault is not only one that has just had an activity. An active fault is one when you put energy into it, it'll slip. Panelists, I want to thank you. Um, it's unfortunate, there are so many good questions and the discussion is lively. Um, but I've been warned that we are essentially over time. Um, uh -uh. <laughs> I know. I, thank you for your passion here. And I want to thank all the panelists. This was a great discussion. I want to thank the audience for, for joining us today and posing such great questions to help invoke this great discussion. Um, and please, um, those in the audience, please join us um, for the rest of, of Pivot 2020. We have great session lined up all week long, um, and you'll be seeing those here um, coming up really soon. So thank everyone. Thanks to our panelists, and um, look forward to seeing you in the future sessions. Bye now.